the title of my sermon this morning is The Heresy of Works Salvation. The Heresy of Works Salvation. So today, I just want to rekindle our hatred for false doctrine, for heresy that is works salvation. And you say hate might be a very strong word, but the Bible says here in Psalm 119, it says, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. See, we ought to hate work salvation. It's not just, oh, it's, it's, it's all right. There's no problem with it. People just think a little bit different. No, as Bible-believing Christians, we ought to love what is right and we ought to hate what is wrong. Why should we hate the heresy of work salvation? Because it sends people to hell. It's really serious. It's not just something that we play around with. That's why it's something we divide over. If people are preaching or people believe a work salvation, we ought to hate that doctrine. We ought to hate every false way. So it's not just that we put up with it and we just get along with it. No, works salvation sends people to hell. And that's why we need to take a strong stand against it. Ephesians 2 that we read, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. See, it's not what you, it's not of your righteousness. Titus is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. So what is work salvation? Well, work salvation is the teaching that you need to keep God's commandments in order to be saved, in order to go to heaven. If there is an element of keeping the commandments, but the Bible is very clear that we don't get to heaven by keeping commandments. We don't get to heaven by doing righteousness, not righteousness of our own. That's why it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. If God gives us a gift, that's something that you don't pay for. We always use that example when we go out soul winning. You might say, hey, if I give you this Bible and I ask for $10, is that a gift? And the person will go, well, no, it's not. But then you say, well, what if I gave you this Bible and I only asked for five cents? Is that a gift? You know, no, hey, it's really cheap. I mean, what Bible can you buy for five cents, especially in Australia? You know, maybe you can get a Bible for a dollar in America, but in Australia, it's really hard to find a cheap Bible. You know? But even if it's cheap, it's not free. It's not a gift. That's why it has to be completely free. It is the gift of God. That's why it's not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could earn your way to heaven, which is impossible, you'd be able to boast. You'd be able to say, hey, I deserve to go to heaven. But because no, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, it's not of works. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So that's what work salvation is. Work salvation is when somebody teaches that somebody has to have an element of keeping the commandments in order to be saved. That good works are required to be saved by uh, saved from hell. Now, work salvation is not that you must do something to be saved. Right? So I don't phrase it that way. I don't phrase it that work salvation is that you must do something to be saved because everybody must do something to be saved. What do you have to do to be saved? You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so we're not Calvinists. We don't believe that God just makes people saved, makes people believe. You don't do anything. No, you do something to be saved. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do we do that? We call upon his name. We call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we put our faith on him. So you have to do something to be saved. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but you don't need to keep the commandments to be saved. Right? Salvation is by grace through faith. Right? We're saved by grace. By grace are you saved through faith. What does that mean? It's through our faith. It's through believing on Jesus Christ that we receive the grace of God, which is being saved from hell, from the punishment of our sins. That's what is the gift of God. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And that lines up with Romans 6.23. Right? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ 
our Lord. Now, the reason why I've included verse 10 here, because often those of us who believe what the Bible says about salvation, that it's not of works lest any man should boast, are often accused of not believing that people as believers ought to do good works. Because they always say, oh yeah, you always quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but why do you always leave 10 out? I'm not scared of verse 10. You know, I don't mind that verse 10 is there. We believe in good work. You know, verse 10 is not teaching that you need to keep works to be saved, otherwise it would directly contradict verses 8 and 9. So what is verse 10 saying? Verse 10 is saying, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So it's not saying that you have to keep good works, you have to do good works in order to be saved. What it's saying is, hey, you are saved by grace through faith. It's not of works, but God saved you for a purpose. Right? He didn't just save you to sit on your rear end and serve yourself your whole life. You know, do things for yourself, do things that please you. No, he saved you so that you would serve him. But even if you don't serve him, you're still saved. Why? Because salvation is by grace. So you don't have to serve the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But if you ask, why did God save you? What purpose does God have for you? Well, God has works that he has before ordained for you to do and he wants you to walk in them, that you should walk in them. See, so what should we do as a Christian? We should do good works. But do we need to do good works to be saved? No, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So really clear in the Bible, this is probably the clearest verse in the Bible. If anyone believes that salvation is by works, this is where you take them. Why does the Bible say that it's not of works? lest any man should boast. This is often the verse that I want to leave for Catholics, you know, because Catholics believe in a work salvation. And this is sometimes the verse I want to leave them. Usually with Orthodox, Orthodox, for some reason when you're at the door, Orthodox always say, oh, nobody can know they're going to heaven. Sometimes it depends like how they, how they respond. But if their response is, you know, it's good enough, or yeah, I, have to, I have to keep God's commandments to go to heaven, this will be the verse I leave them with. But if they say something like, well, nobody can know I'm going to heaven, that's when you'd leave them with 1 John 5.13, right? You can know that you have eternal life. Now, Satan is subtle, isn't he? Because it's so clear in the Bible that salvation is not by works, if somebody just said to you, well, you need to keep the commandments to be saved, you'd be like, well, that's heresy. That's work salvation. But Satan is more subtle than that. If he's going to make work salvation creep into Bible-believing Christians, creep into a Bible-believing church, he's going to be a lot more subtle than just saying, hey, keep the commandments to go to heaven. Do good works to go to heaven. Because that's too obvious. So he's going to be a lot more subtle than that. So in 2 Corinthians 11, we read about Satan's subtlety. Look at this. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So see, the same way that Satan was subtle in the beginning. If you remember when he went to Eve, he didn't just tell her, hey, if you eat of this tree, you know, you're, you're basically going to be falling, you're going to sin. You know, he, tried, he was subtle about it, right? He, he didn't just say it outright. He, he questioned things. Yeah, he hath God said. Hey, is, is salvation really that easy? That's what people will say when they try and get you to question salvation. You mean you can just live however you want? And still be saved which is a bit of a misrepresentation because we don't believe that believers can just live however they want you ought to not just live however you want but if you live however you want and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you're still saved but you see how they'll sort of try and say things like that to say oh you, you can't just you can't just you think God just fine with just how living however you want you can still go to heaven and you think like yeah that, that doesn't sound right yeah, it's because they're not separating salvation from the Christian life, which is works. From the simplicity that is in Christ. His salvation truly is simple, isn't it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you might think, well, if salvation is so simple, you know, how come we can preach, you know, sermon after sermon after sermon on salvation? You know, I thought salvation, you know, you had to know about Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, you know, he went to hell, you know, all these different things. Why is it saying it's simple? Well, it's because it's simple because what you have to do is simple. Right? All you have to do is trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to do any works. All you have to do is know that Jesus Christ is enough. Like we learned this morning in Leviticus, you know, and, and John the Baptist 
saying, hey, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I like to liken it to uh, like a mechanic. If you think about how, you know, what do you need to know about a car in order to drive it? So let me turn this, uh, these air cons back on. You know, knowing how to drive a car is very easy, isn't it? Just get in the car, drive from A to B. But if you need to learn about how to fix a car, how that car actually works under the hood, hey, that's a lot more complex. It's the same with salvation. Yeah, if you want to know how it all works under the hood, it gets a lot more complex. But how, what you need to do to drive it is really easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says here, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. See, so Paul here is warning that subtle false doctrine, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel might come along. And if you are not awake, diligent to what the truth is, he's saying here, ye might well bear with him. What is he saying? You might put up with it. You might accept it. You might not think it's that big of a deal when the Bible says, hey, we ought to hate every false way. Work salvation is a big deal. And the more subtle it is, I think the more of a big deal it is. Because when somebody tries to counterfeit something, if somebody tries to trick you into believing something else, the closer it is, the better of a counterfeit it is, isn't it? You know, nobody's going to get away with preaching work salvation if they just tell you, I believe in work salvation. But if they preach it a bit more subtly, that's what you need to be aware of. So that's what I want to go through today. I want to go through seven subtle forms of work salvation that I want you to be aware of and to realize that they are indeed work salvation heresy. What's the first one? This is the first one. That you'll hear a lot of people say when you go out soul winning, because this is what a lot of Catholics and Orthodox believe. They'll say things like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, Jesus died for my sins. Jesus is our sacrifice, but I've got to do my part. You've got to do your part, though. You know, it's not that Jesus, you know, Jesus did 99%, but you have 1% to do. This is work salvation. Why? Because you can't mix any works into grace. If you remember the analogy I gave you with the Bible, even if I gave you that Bible and I expected five cents off you, it's no longer a gift. And this is how grace and works work. Once you mix any works into grace, it's no longer grace. And that's why salvation by grace must be all grace, otherwise it's salvation by works. These are your two options. Your two options are either you keep all the commandments and you then earn a place in heaven, which is, not, which is impossible, which is why we have salvation by grace. There is no option where it's a mix of the two, where Jesus is going to get you 99.9% .9 of the way there and you just have to do your 0.1% to get there. Once you mix in any works, that's works. Romans 11.6, if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see how you can't mix the two. And this is why Paul, in Galatians 5, he is so adamant about them believing salvation by grace and not being bewitched by people trying to bring in a false gospel. Look at what he says here in Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is he referring to? The yoke of bondage is the fact that you are trying to earn your way to heaven. And that's what was happening in the Galatian church. There were people, Judaizers, creeping in, saying that people needed to be circumcised. They needed to keep that commandment in order to be saved. Now we know that circumcision is a commandment that's no longer applicable in the New Testament. But here they were saying not only was it still applicable in the New Testament, that that had, had to be kept in order for people to be saved. And Paul says here, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So you see there, it's not that Christ shall profit you 99.9% .9 and then, yeah, you just get circumcised and then 
That's gonna, you're going to be doing your part. No, no. If you think you have to be circumcised in order to be saved, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why? For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So you see there that if you have to keep one commandment in order to go to heaven, guess what? You have to keep all the commandments to go to heaven. Is that what you want? If you want to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage? See, this is what people don't realize. They think, hey, if you do your part, no, you're going to have to do the whole part. That's going to be your part. Unless you make that whole part Jesus. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. See, you're not saved if you think you have to do your part. You know, another thing that people accuse us of, you know, they're just going back to works, you know, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. They'll say, you know, you don't think people need to strive to do works. And of course, we believe people should do works. They just don't need to do works to get saved. But you know, another thing people will say when you believe salvation by grace and you say, you know, it's no works to get to heaven. People often will say things like, well, then why would anyone do good works if they're going to heaven anyway? If you're saved anyway, why would you do works? And you know, somebody that says that isn't saved, right? Because if the only reason why you're doing good works is to be saved and go to heaven, that's work salvation. That's, that's you earn, trying to earn your way to heaven. If, if heaven is one of the things that you are working for, one of the reasons why you are doing good works, you need to be aware that you are not believing work salvation. Beware, you know, make sure that you're in the faith. That's what the Bible is talking about. When you examine yourself, you prove, make sure you're believing the right thing. Because if you think, hey, if I get out of church, I'm not living right. Hey, well, the only reason why there is to do good works is to be saved. You may not be saved yourself. right? Because that's not a reason why we do good works. Now, there are plenty of reasons why to do good works. You know, some people think being saved and going to heaven is the only reason, why to do, uh, only reason to do good works. No, there are plenty of good reasons to do good works. One is if you love God. One is if you love other people. You know, don't you want others to be saved? You, know, you do good work because you want, to be, you want to be a testimony. You want to be a greater witness to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be pleasing. You want to be a blessing to your family. Because if you're a Christian that has a dead faith, you know what? You are going to be a curse on your family. You will bring your family down. You'll get them out of church. You will raise kids that do not love and do not want to serve the Lord Jesus. This is where it's profitable to have works in your faith rather than just having faith alone. So there are plenty of reasons why good works are needed, but they are not needed for salvation. Let's move on. Number two, maybe you've heard this one where people say, you know, often it's at an altar call, right? Now you go to a Pentecostal church or even you go to a Baptist church, right? And they bow your head, close your eyes. Hey, if you're not saved here, walk down the aisle so you can get saved. Today is the day to give your life to Jesus. That's what they'll say. Now this is another form of work salvation. And it's so ludicrous that people will say, give your life to Jesus to be saved. Why? Because the gospel is the complete opposite. The gospel is the complete opposite of you giving your life to Jesus. You know what the gospel is? That Jesus gave his life for you. So this is the complete opposite of salvation. And yet people are saying this and believing this as though they have to do this to get saved. And don't get me wrong, these things, these seven things that I'm going to tell you today, you know, there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. Like with works, there's nothing wrong with works. You know, otherwise they'd be called bad works. They're called good works because they're good. It's where they are. See, good works are good, but if you put good works before salvation in order to be saved, that's where it's heresy. Works, works belong after salvation. So I'm not saying, hey, it's bad to give your life to Jesus. Hey, we ought to give our life to Jesus. As Christians but we don't give our life to Jesus to be saved that's where it becomes heresy right so I'm not against doing good. I'm not against all these things that I'm talking about it's that if you put them before salvation that's when it becomes heresy 
It's a bit like fornication, isn't it? See, fornication, you know, having, having uh, you know, sleeping with your partner when you're married is a beautiful thing. You know, when people kiss and they hug and they hold hands, when you see a married couple doing that, that's a beautiful thing. But you put it before marriage, now it becomes filthy. Now it becomes disgusting. Now it becomes something that ought not to be done. And it's the same with works. You put it before salvation, it's heresy. It belongs after salvation. And this one especially is the complete opposite. Why? Because Jesus gave his life for us to be saved. We don't give our life to him to be saved. We give our life to him once we're saved as a living sacrifice. Look what Jesus says here. He says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Minister means to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why we're redeemed, right? He gave his life to pay for us, to redeem us back. Galatians 1, look at what it says here. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. Who gave himself for our sins. See, we don't give ourselves to be saved for our sins. He gave himself for our sins that we might deliver us, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. So that's number two. Number two was, so what are we talking about so far? You need to do your part. Give your life to Jesus to be saved. What's number three? Number three, maybe you've heard somebody say this before. That you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. They may, they may say it like this. You don't only receive Jesus as your Savior, but you need to receive him as Lord as well. This is work salvation. If you need to receive Jesus as your Lord to be saved, that's work salvation. Why? Because what does it mean to receive somebody as your Lord? You know, they'll say things like this. They'll say, if he's not Lord of all, and this is not what I'm saying, this is what people who believe in work salvation say, or believe that you have to give, you know, make Jesus the Lord of your life, uh, often it's referred to as Lordship salvation, or um, you know, receiving Jesus not only as your Saviour, but also as your Lord. They'll say things like this, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. What are they trying to say? They're trying to say, if Jesus is not Lord in every aspect of your life, then he's not your Lord at all, and you're not saved. That's what they're trying to say. Now, this is absolute rubbish. That you have to make Jesus Lord of all to be saved. Because the thing is, if Jesus is Lord of all, guess what? You would never sin. Because every time you sin, that's when Jesus isn't Lord. Right? So if you have to make Jesus Lord of all in order to be saved, guess what? You'd have to be perfect in order to be saved. Right? Because every time you sin, Jesus is not Lord. You know who's Lord? You are. You're serving sin. Look what Jesus says in John 8. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin, look at this, is the servant of sin. So can anyone really claim that Jesus is Lord of all when we still sin? No, the only way we make Jesus Lord of all is in the Spirit. Because we have the new man and the old man. Yeah, the new man has Jesus as Lord of all. But the Christian as a whole, we have the Spirit and the flesh. And this is why we still sin. This is why the Christian as a whole has not made Jesus their Lord. And to tell somebody that is not even saved, that doesn't even have a born-again spirit, that doesn't even have the new man, that doesn't sin, how is that person meant to make Jesus Lord of all? When all they have is the flesh. All they know how to do is sin. Romans 6.16 Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. See, so every time we sin, Jesus is not Lord. If you had to make Jesus the Lord in order to be saved, you know what? Nobody can be saved because that would be impossible. Look what Jesus says. Jesus says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So does it even matter if somebody confesses Jesus as Lord and is not even keeping his commandments? Because Jesus is saying, why do you even call me Lord, Lord, and you don't even do what I tell you to do? Do you see how keeping his commandments is what makes Jesus Lord? And here in Matthew 7, we have people that made Jesus Lord, and guess what? They went to hell. 
Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. I'll come back to that. Many will say to me in that day. See, not few. There are a lot of people that are profess professing Christians that believe in work salvation. It's so sad. They are so close to the truth. Most of them even have John 3.16 memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And yet you ask them, why are you going to heaven? Well, it's because I'm a pretty good person. <laughs> Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So why were these people in Matthew 7? Why were they they're doing good works? They're doing good works in the name of Jesus. They're making Jesus their Lord. But why are they not saved? Why are they not saved? Because they didn't receive Jesus as Savior. They are trusting their good works. They are believing in work salvation. Now you may say, well, why does Jesus say, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Well, it's because in John 6, this is what Jesus says, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So you see how the will of the Father is not for you to work your way to heaven, because these people in Matthew 7 were trying to work their way to heaven. No, the will of the Father is that you believe on the Son, that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's how you fulfill the will in order to be saved. Let's go on to number four. So number three was you make Jesus the Lord of your life. Work salvation, heresy. Number four is sin can cause you to lose salvation. Right? So these are people that believe you can lose salvation through sin. Now, I would like to distinguish, I'd like to clarify this one in terms of, there are people out there that believe that if you stop believing, that you'd lose your salvation. I think that would be separate. I don't think that's necessarily somebody trusting their works. To me, that's somebody that misunderstands the doctrine of eternal security. Right, because somebody might be confused how salvation works. And they might think, well, I, I had to believe to get saved, so if I don't believe, then shouldn't I not be saved? No, because salvation is a one-way street. Salvation is once you are saved, you're always saved. Right? You cannot lose salvation. Right? Once you receive grace, you can't give it away anymore. Right? Because you're sealed. You have eternal life. You know, for you to be able to give away or believe away salvation, you would never have received eternal life to begin with, right? Because to, to lose salvation means that you would die, that you would not have eternal life. So somebody, there are people out there that believe if you stop believing that you may not be saved. Now, to me, that's a hypothetical. I don't know how many people out there that actually understand true salvation and believe true salvation would ever actually stop believing true salvation because most people when they refer to people that stop believing and this is what you have to be aware of sometimes people will say oh yeah but what if i stop believing but to them they think a bit like an orthodox or a pentecostal that believing means that you're serving jesus that you're following jesus so to them they're thinking yeah well if you stop believing meaning if you forsake the faith and you get into sin you quit church you forsake jesus then you're no longer saved that person is believing work salvation Right? Because they believe that they have to, to keep a certain path, keep commandments or not sin in order to stay saved. But if somebody just thinks, well, what if I have doubt? What if I stop? What if someday I just I become an agnostic and just think, you know what, I don't, know, I don't think God exists. I don't believe in work salvation. I just don't know what's true. Now, is that possible? I think it's possible. Is it probable? I'm not too sure. I don't know how many people actually find themselves in that situation. But if that was a true situation, if that actually did happen, that person would still be saved. If they truly received salvation and they had a lapse in faith, they would still be saved. If somebody thinks they wouldn't be saved, I think they're just a bit confused on the doctrine of eternal security. But if somebody thinks you can sin away your salvation, you know, if you forsake Jesus, if you get out of church, you get back into sin, you go back to your old ways, you start serving the flesh, then you are no longer saved. That is work salvation. That is heresy. And just on the topic of somebody believing, 
don't, not believing anymore, they still say. This is what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2. The Bible says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So why are you still saved even though you no longer believe? Because God says, hey, if you receive salvation by grace, you have eternal life. Even if you stop believing, God's not going to go back on his part of the bargain. Right? He's not going to go back on his part of salvation, which is he gave you everlasting life. He's not going to become a liar just because you stop believing in him. That's why we're always saved. Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now, does never mean never? Is Jesus a liar? No. When Jesus says you'll never perish, that means you'll never perish. You have eternal life. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. It's the same hand. Because right? when you're in Jesus' hand, you are in the Father's hand. Because I and my Father are one. Now, why are you always saved? Why can't you sin away salvation, even if you forsake Jesus? Look what Jesus. Look at what it says in Hebrews 13. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. There's that word never again. Now, this is how I like to think of eternal security. Right? It would be like if I was walking with my child, and I was holding their hand. And maybe, you know, sometimes your child gets away from you, right? Because we're not perfect. But let's say, you know, you're holding your child's hand. Your child tries to get away from you. What do you do when your child tries to get away? You hold tighter, don't you? You hold onto them tighter. And that's what God does with us. The more we try and get away from him, the stronger he holds. See, you may forsake Jesus. You may leave Jesus. But Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Right? So you, you, try, and, you try and run as far away from Jesus as you can. He's going to be right there with you. Right, trying to get you back. That's how eternal security works. Number five is a bit longer. We're going to go through a, a little bit of James too. Number five, so I've got three more to go with, through with you, is when people say this. People say, yeah, yeah, you got, you got faith, but it's not just any old faith that saves you. You need to have a genuine saving faith. Now, a faith on Jesus Christ is a genuine saving faith. So, in, in a sense, I agree with this. You better have a genuine saving faith, a faith that is completely on Jesus Christ, not on yourself. That's a genuine saving faith. But oftentimes when people say you must have a genuine saving faith, you know what they're talking about? Works. They're saying if you don't have works, then your faith counts for nothing. And your faith does not count for righteousness, which is completely opposite to what the Bible says says. Well, where do they get this from? They get it from James. I just want to go through this quickly. This is where they get this idea that you have to have not only faith, but also works in order to be saved. James 2. What doth it profit, my brethren? So who is James all talking to here anyway? He's talking to, he's talking to saved people. And he's talking about whether your faith is profitable. Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save you? And there's so much, I mean, I could go through this, I could spend a whole sermon on this chapter, right, which I have in the past. But just in this one verse, there's just so many things that pull apart work salvation. I mean, he's saying, what is it, how is it profitable, right? And he's saying here to my brethren, to people that are saved, and then he says, a man say he hath faith. So it's not, we don't even know if this person even has faith or not. This person, by all, all intents and purposes, could have faith, but he's just expressing it to somebody else. And he's talking about, hey, when you say you have faith to somebody, is it profitable if you don't have works as well? But he may actually have faith. And the Bible says here, can faith save him? Now, there's a few different positions on what this can mean. Obviously, the work salvation crowd will say that this, say, this, the answer to this is no, that it doesn't save you spiritually. Now, this is a question. This is not a statement. This is not saying this faith will not save him. This is asking, can faith save him? Now, the question is, well, what is it saving him from? Now, we're talking about eternal salvation. Can faith, can a dead faith on Jesus Christ save him from eternal salvation, from eternal damnation? Yes, right, which we will see in Romans 4. Now, if it says, well, can it save him physically? 
Well, this is what is being talked about. Physically from something. You know, I've had different positions on this passage. Where I'm sort of sitting right now is I read the context of James 2. You know, you read the first half of James 2, it's talking about having the faith of Jesus Christ with respect of persons, right? And then therefore that makes you a transgressor of the law, even though you may have the faith, you may be saved. And that there is a judgment that God can bring down on you, right? A chastisement that God can bring down on you for, you know, not having good works as a Christian. So I, I sometimes wonder whether it's referring to that, meaning, you know, hey, you used to say you have faith. If you're saved, yet you don't have good works, is that going to save you from God's judgment in the sense of a judgment as a believer, chastisement of God? It's like my children, just being my children, doesn't save them from discipline, doesn't save them from judgment, from righteous judgment as a believer. But it's not talking about eternal judgment as an unbeliever. And then it goes on, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. So what is it talking about now? Your faith physically profiting somebody else. See, if you just say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So you see how it's talking about your faith being profitable to somebody else, not being profitable to you which is what they're trying to say. They're saying, what doth it profit to you? Is that faith going to save you? No, James 2 is, what doth it profit to other people? Right? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now, dead doesn't mean it's non-existent. See, in the Bible, the Bible describes Sarah's womb, Sarah, Abraham's wife, as being dead. But the womb was there. Right, the womb is there, it's just not bringing forth any life. See, so when the Bible says something is dead, it doesn't mean it's not existent. It means that you're not bringing forth life. See, your faith will not be bring forth life in other people if you don't add works to it. Right? But the reason why our faith gives us life is because Jesus did the works. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So you see again, the transaction is going horizontal, right? It's me trying to show my faith to another man that cannot see my heart. That's why you need to add works to it. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now this is where it's key. This is where you can absolutely prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that James 2 is talking about our faith in the eyes of men and not our faith in the eyes of God justifying us from sin. Was not Abraham... So you see here, notice how Abraham is used as an example in James 2. Abraham, our father, was justified by works. When... So when was he justified by works? When he had offered his Isaac, his son, upon the altar. So take note of that. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. See, I've underlined seest thou because this is key. You can see it all through the passage once it's pointed out to you. You see how it's you showing your faith to somebody else? And he's saying how, you see how you saw Abraham's faith when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See, it's not that God saw his faith. It was that you saw his faith when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and it was called the friend of God. Why was it fulfilled? Because then now you can see it being fulfilled, because you don't know what's in Abraham's heart. Ye see then. See how it's, both, it's there? I don't know if you've ever seen that when you read through James 2. Seest thou? See how you see? And then it says here, you see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only right you see it now how do we know that this is not talking about our salvation eternally well because we compare it with romans 4 and keep this in mind guys memorize these two passages and know them because i am yet to find a jehovah's witness that has knocked on my door and i've brought them to romans 4 to explain this to me even when I show it to them in the New World Translation, it's just beautiful seeing the look on their face as we read through Romans 4 and they realize what it is saying because it's so clear even in their Bible. 
the, the, the closest I've had, like every Jehovah's Witness I've showed this to has always had to take it away and study it out a bit more. Romans 4. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? So you see how Abraham again is used as an example. So we can link it with James 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. Look at this. But not before God. So you see how James 2 was Abraham's faith in the eyes of men, but Romans 4 is Abraham being justified in the eyes of God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So you see, if you work for salvation, then it's owed to you. Right? But if you get it by grace, then that's when it's by grace. It's given to you. It's not something of debt. Verse 5, But to him that worketh not... Now these are the most beautiful verses in the Bible. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now this is what's always interesting about this passage, is people will say faith without works is dead. Well here's an example of a dead faith. Here's an example where you have faith and no works, but the man is counted for righteousness. Isn't that interesting? Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Who won't he impute sin to? The one that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? So saying, hey, do you only get it if you're circumcised? No. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When was Abraham counted as righteous? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. You see how Romans 4 is clearly saying, hey, even before Abraham was given the covenant of circumcision, he was already saved. He was already saved by grace, by believing on the Lord, calling upon the Lord for salvation. That's when he was saved. But what did James say? James said he was justified by works when he had offered his son Isaac upon the altar. So you see the discrepancy there. Even James is saying, hey, yeah, you saw his faith when he went through that temptation, that trial to sacrifice his son to the Lord. But when was he made righteous? When he called upon the Lord, when he believed and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Let's talk about number six. This is my second last one. This one you'll hear a lot, and this one is all over Baptist churches. And I preached a whole sermon on it a couple of weeks ago when we were at Punchbowl building, so if you didn't listen to that sermon, because I'm not going to go into it as deep as I did in that sermon, but go listen to that sermon. It's called Repentance in the Bible. Repentance in the Bible. But this is another one where you hear people saying, you must repent of your sins to be saved. And just like the others are blatant work salvation when you think about what it's actually saying, this is the same. This is a blatant work salvation if you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Let me explain it to you a bit differently with 1 John 3. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. You break the law when you transgress something. For sin is transgression of the law. Right, so sin is when you are breaking the law. When you break the law, what are you doing? You are not keeping the commandments. Now, if somebody says to you, you need to repent, or you need to turn from not keeping the commandments, what are they saying? You need to keep the commandments. Because how do I turn? I don't turn from not keeping the commandments to just doing nothing, because I'm still not keeping the commandments. See, in order for me to turn from not keeping the commandments, I have to keep the commandments to turn from them. But if somebody says to you, keep the commandments to be saved, you say work salvation, you'll say heresy. 
But if somebody says, turn from your sins to be saved, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe they're right. I've got I to turn from sins to be saved. Yeah, granted, some people say this, and what they mean by it is you just acknowledge that you're a sinner to be saved. Yeah, well, if they just mean that, then maybe that's what they should say as well. You know, I could say, hey, you need to be baptized to be saved. But what I mean by that is you just need to acknowledge that you're a sinner. Well, then why are you telling me to get back? Why are you telling me to do something that I don't actually have to do to be saved? You know, they have a misunderstanding of this word. To repent of your sins means to turn from them. And because sin is not keeping the law, when you turn from sin, you have to keep the law to be saved. And that's why it's a blatant works salvation, works salvation message. We see this in Ezekiel 18. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, so you see how turning away from righteousness, the opposite is that you commit iniquity. And when you turn away from committing iniquity, the opposite is that you're being righteous. And dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right. So you see how these are two sides of the same coin? He shall save his soul alive, because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he had committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, The ways of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, not my ways equal, are not your ways unequal. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. This was the Old Testament message. The Old Testament message to keep the commandments to find mercy. But this is not the message of the New Testament of grace, which is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And you know, you'll never see them, you know, yeah, they want to go to this passage. They'll go to a passage like Ezekiel 18.30 to try and prove their repent of your sins to be saved. But look at what it says. It says, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. You know, even if somebody, you know, is trying to repent of all their sins, I don't think any believer has tried to repent of all their sins. Because you know what? If you repented of all your sins, guess what? You wouldn't be sinning anymore. But we all still sin. But they'll go to a passage like this to say, yeah, well, you just got to try your best to repent of all your sins. Is that what this says? Is this where it's just, just try your best, turn away yourselves from some or most of all your sins? No, it's turn away from all your sins. That's why it's a covenant that couldn't be kept. That's why we can't keep the old covenant. We keep the covenant of grace by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jonah 3 just plainly states that it's works. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Why can we say that repenting or turning from your sins is works? The Bible clearly defines it as works. God saw their works. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I've already preached a whole sermon on this. But So what is repentance in regards to salvation? So it's not that repentance has no place in salvation it's just that it's not a repentance of sin therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward god so what is the repentance in regards to salvation it's turning away from trusting your works it's turning away from what we're talking about this morning which is trusting your works working your way to heaven that's what you turn from and then you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now the last one's a quick one. I don't have any verses necessarily to go with it. But this is the last one I just added. I, I didn't uh, add this one when I preached this sermon three years ago but number seven is this one you must be willing to follow jesus you must be willing to follow Jesus. because you know pe people that you know recognize that work salvation is impossible know that it's foolish to say you need to follow jesus or you need to keep the commandments to be saved so this this is this is this is what they end up going to they end up saying well you don't have to actually keep the commandments to be saved you just have to be willing to keep the commandments to be saved. 
Now, somehow they think that makes it not work salvation. But a few questions, a few things for you to think about when somebody says you just have to be willing to follow Jesus or willing to keep the commandments to be saved. One of the questions is, why do I have to be willing to do something that's completely irrelevant to salvation? You know, like if I was to give you something for free, and I said, here's a gift for you, but you have to be willing to pay me $10, you'd think, but, but it's free, it doesn't cost anything. Why, why, why do I have to be willing to pay something for something that's free? It's the same when somebody says, you have to be willing to do works in order to be saved. Well, why am I willing to do something that's irrelevant to salvation? So you don't have to do works to be saved. So being willing to do works is completely irrelevant. Number two, a question is, where in the Bible does it say be willing to, to keep commandments to be saved? Every verse that they'll take you to to try and prove work salvation says do work salvation. Do works to be saved. Keep the commandments to be saved. Like we showed in this like they'll go to something like this and you'll see hey it says you need to turn from your iniquity and you need to do which that is lawful and right it doesn't say turn from that he had committed and be willing to do that which is lawful and right no see it's not just the desire to do what's right all the verses say you need to do it and lastly what they'll say is see because if somebody says they're willing to do works and then they don't do works. You know what they'll say? Well, it's because they weren't really willing. Right? So it always goes back to works. Yeah, you just need to be willing to repent of your sins. You just need to be willing to keep the command. You just need to be willing to purpose in your heart to follow Jesus. And then when they're out of church, ah, see, they weren't willing. That's why they weren't saved, because they weren't keeping the commands. It's just work salvation, people. It's just work salvation, just tied up in another bow, made to make it look more acceptable. It's the same heresy over and over and over again, which is you trusting your own works. Let's end on this passage, Galatians 1. Why are we splitting hairs on this? Why is this so important? Why do you say, oh yeah, but you know, people don't really mean that. Well, if they don't mean that, then stop saying it. You know, if you don't mean work salvation, then stop saying work salvation. Just tell people they have to admit they're a sinner and believe on Jesus Christ. Stop telling them to give their life to Jesus, to make Jesus the Lord of their life, to, to be willing to follow him. Because when people who are not, don't know what you're talking about hear that, guess what? They're going to believe work salvation. That's why it's a big deal. Because if somebody believes it, they're going to go to hell and not heaven. And, you know, oftentimes I don't think we make a big deal of it enough. You say, Victor, why are you making such a big deal of these things? Honestly, I don't think I make a big enough deal of it. You know, oftentimes I get soft. That's why I need a sermon like this sometimes to get fired up about false doctrine and that I have the right type of righteous hatred towards a doctrine that will send people to hell for all eternity. Look at what Paul says. I marvel, because I'm shocked, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, meaning there is no other gospel. There's only one gospel. There's only other false gospels. So he says, that's why he says it's another gospel, but it's not another, because there's only one. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So you see how these subtle forms of work salvations, they're not just blatantly works. They take, they take something close to salvation and they just pervert it just a little. But though we, but though we, so Paul is saying, hey, I'm including myself in what I'm about to say. Right? He's including, he's saying, even if we, as the apostles of Jesus Christ do this, this is how we ought to think of it. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Amen. What is the Bible saying here? Paul is saying, let him be accursed, let him go to hell. Because that's how serious it is when people preach work salvation, 
Paul's getting worked up here and saying, hey, even if we do it, let him be accursed. Now, can a saved person preach work salvation? They can. Because heresies is a work of the flesh. Now, does that mean they're going to go to hell? No. Because you can't lose salvation. But how should we think of this preaching of another gospel? Let them be accursed. And we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. Amen. See, not only was Galatians the only letter that Paul wrote with his own hand, because salvation by grace was so important, he wrote this letter with his own hand, but he said this twice. He said, hey, I've said it before, I'm going to write it again, I'm going to say it again, that if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. You know, I pray that today this sermon, you know, increases your hatred for the false things, for false, the heresy of work salvation, and stand strong in true salvation. You know, if you know people using the wrong terminology, yeah, be gentle with them, but correct it. We need to correct terminology so people are preaching the right gospel the right way. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the clarity and the simplicity of the gospel in the word of God. And I just thank you, Lord. You've made it so simple for us. You loved us that much. And you did the hard part. We just need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, it doesn't stop there. Yes, our salvation is secure. Our salvation is final. But you want us to do good works. There are good works that you have before ordained that you want us to do. And I pray, Lord, that as we should walk in them, we will walk in them. Help us, Lord. We need your grace. Um, help us to walk as we ought. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity on this earth to be your ambassador. I pray that we would take that task seriously. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand. Let's sing uh, one last hymn. We're just going to sing three verses of Jesus Saves. Jesus Saves. Let's sing it, nice, sing it out nice and loud. Jesus Saves. Here we go.